with their manifold skills. People with hands deft and sure that fashion and shape articles of beauty, both for barter and exchange, or for sale as a means of livelihood in a simple and uncomplicated way of life. People with gay and colorful dress along the country road. Or on the city walks. And do you notice the timid smiles lighting shy, friendly faces? For example, here is Pedro Lopez. Oh, Pedro, we affectionately called him. Perhaps we will never see this charming little man again, but here are two constant reminders of an unforgettable personality. A warm smile and the old man's Sunday shoes, symbols of vital elements in his daily existence, sun and dust. Many roads lead to the fabulous land of sun and dust, but three great arteries carry the majority of American visitors into the country. Our venture begins as we cross the Rio Grande River at Laredo. A final inspection reveals all the essentials, including our tourist card, the only document needed for a safe and pleasant journey. Our spirits high, a rolling road invites us toward a distant horizon and our immediate destination, Monterey. Have you ever looked carefully at the national flag of Mexico? In the center is a symbol of a nopal cactus, for cactus occupies an important place in the history and economy of the country. We don't travel far until sights of cactus appear, some straight and rigid, silent sentinels of the desert. Some grotesque and bizarre, bristling like porcupines with sharp, defiant quills. Others colorful with brilliant flowers, odd shapes and all sizes, for there are 500 or more species identified with Mexico. Cactus everywhere, planned and planted by the hand of a kindly and benevolent creator, who foresaw that human life could not long exist on these sandy, sun part stretches without just such a wonder plan. Wonderful? because cactus is capable of supplying man's daily necessities, food, clothing, water, and other useful items. Every cactus has some practical purpose. For example, look at that sturdy fellow, serving nicely as storage. No need for corn cribs here. Most prominent among the cactus is maguey, a source of rope that is often processed right along the busy highway. The giant green leaves of this cactus are first cut and split to a workable size. The blades are then beaten to loosen the pulp. The bruised leaf is combed, often with a crude nail-studded board, to remove the moist, clinging pulp, leaving tough, resilient strands to be flung on lines to dry in the hot Mexican sun. Thoroughly dried, the stringy material is then skillfully spun into serviceable strands. Later to be twisted into many thicknesses, making cord, rope, and even thread for hand sewing much of which is done by older men as they pass the time of day on sunny, pleasant streets. Toil-worn fingers fashioning useful household articles. The thin skin of the maguey is also used to manufacture a kind of parchment paper. Some cactus is not so beneficial, for the earliest history of cactus is said to be associated with one of man's oldest vices, intoxicating liquors and beverages. One intoxicating liquor, called tequila, is made from the living hearts of the tequila cactus. 
Cactus harvested from the fields is brought into processing plants. The great cores are chopped into smaller blocks and roasted in huge ovens. The juice is later extracted to make a powerful drink. Vinegar and even molasses is made from these hardy desert plants. Before we realize it, Monterey breaks into view. This great commercial center is the industrial heart of Mexico. Much of the colonial aspect of the city has disappeared with the changing times, but the city blends charming Mexican characteristics with comfortable American improvements. The surrounding country invites exploration. For example, there is Horsetail Falls, high in nearby mountains. Automobiles must be discarded in favor of the Horsetail Falls Express. All aboard! And now, if the Express will just wait long enough for passengers to get aboard, we'll be on our way. A little rough, but it beats walking. It won't be long until the falls, heard long before they are seen, will be in view. On valley floors, it's the plowing season. Dust filters upward from busy plows, delicately veiling the mountainside with a gossamer haze. West of Monterey is Huasteca Canyon, famous for its rocked rib gorges and fantastic rock formations, shearing sharply up, dwarfing all else in sight. To the southwest, a high road clings to the stony ridge of the Sierra Madres, twisting, curving, descending to the city of orchids, to the seacoast town of Papantla, hot, low, tropical. Do you know that species of orchids? They are by far the most exotic blossoms of the humid jungle land. Orchids are often called parasites. This is not so. Actually, they are true air plants. That is, they thrive best by simply clinging to a single stem or to the limb of a neighboring tree. And do you know that one variety is edible and used almost every day in your home? This commercial flower is found in only two places in the world on the faraway island of Madagascar and here in the region around Papantla. The blossoms produce long aromatic beans called sticks and when ripened sufficiently are harvested and hauled into busy processing plants. The sticks are seasoned three days in drying kilns under evenly controlled temperatures. They are then transferred to straw mats outside to finish drying in the warm, brilliant sunshine. To prevent molding in the moist sea air, they must be taken in every night. To produce profitably, the orchids must be pollinated by hand, a careful, painstaking job. Each Indian tribe is noted for some particular craft, contributing to the economy of an agricultural people. The commercial orchid process belongs to the Totonacan Indians. The seasoned orchid sticks are finally brought into inspection sheds. Tiny, bitter stem ends are clipped and the imperfect beans discarded. The cured sticks are bundled, packaged, and exported to the United States to be made into America's most popular flavor. If the cooks in your family use pure vanilla extract, chances are 
they are cooking with the orchids of Papantla. Besides the edible flower, an infinite variety of orchids abound throughout this warm, sun-drenched land. Unusual foliage, lifting lacy fingers upward, weave unfamiliar patterns against the faultless blue of summer skies. There are countless blossoming plants in Mexico, for this land has no dormant season. Here, the familiar vie with the unusual ones that flourish only in tropic climes. Gay and gaudy plants add splashes of color everywhere, for the Mexican cultivates and cherishes the beauty that is found on every hand in his native land. The mountain village of 14 is noted for giant gardenias. The Ruiz Galindo Hotel is world famous for its gardenia pool. Every morning, large hampers of sweet-scented gardenias are gathered from local gardens and poured into the shimmering waters of the pool. Quite a bit different than the old swimming hole back home, isn't it? But the splash is the same. Say, gardenias are not all that add to the beauty and the inviting waters of the gardenia pool. In the midst of this lush country lies the charming little city of Jalapa, called the Flower Garden of Mexico. Cranberries? No. Chances are that you drank a brew made from the cured and roasted beans this very morning. Coffee, strangely enough, is a member of the evergreen family. The plants do not bear well in the glare of the hot sun. Therefore, they are planted in the shade of other trees. Coffee thrives best in rich, sandy soil on highlands, where the yearly temperature remains between 60 and 90 degrees. The blooms, which cluster closely to the stem, are waxy white blossoms that fill the air with a sweet, heady fragrance. The plants are often in flower and fruit at the same time. The trees start bearing when they are three years old. Some of them will continue producing for a hundred years. To ensure the best flavor, the fruit must be picked at just the right time. The processing plant is usually located right on the plantation. When the berries arrive, they are washed through many sluices to remove the leaves, twigs, and the like. The berries then go into great hollers where they lose their bright cherry red coats. The fruit is further processed to separate the twin seeds from the plump, juicy berry. The freed coffee beans are channeled into fermenting vats to cure for a time then brought out and spread on immense cement platforms where they remain many days in the dry air, constantly turned and raked. You might say they are untouched by human hands. Each bean receives sufficient air and sun to ensure a well-seasoned crop. The dried seeds are covered with a thin parchment-like outer coat which must be removed before roasting. The harvested beans are now ready for shipment abroad. Mexican berries are sought for their delicate, aromatic flavor. The United States consumes more than one half of all the coffee in the world, and every year our demand increases. The highest, most spectacular terrain in the country rises in the region around Jalapa and Puebla. Some of the world's tallest volcanoes thrust their snowy cones up into the clouds. The continent's most symmetrical volcano Orizaba is over 18,000 feet high. Orizaba is higher than our giant Mont Whitney in California. What do you do when you're out of gas and filling stations are out too? Start shopping. Stores carry it in barrels. 
A few impurities, maybe, but that old felt hat is a wonderful strainer. Everywhere, rugged peaks and rocky crags jut up into the sky, crests often draped in trailing clouds of mist. The road inches along steep inclines, then plunges sharply into broad valleys below. Twisting and turning in a series of cutbacks and hairpin curves, the highway stretches off into the distance as far as the eye can see. Puebla, situated in a broad glen, is one of the great Spanish-built cities of the Republic. Puebla has done much to foster and preserve her early arts and traditions. The first continental enclosed market is still in use, serving now as art studios. Plays are still presented in the oldest theater constructed in the New World. Lovely senoritas still occupy this balcony, the first ever granted permission to be built in the Americas. To people of a modern age, Puebla means the home of brilliant, finely Indians learn this art. Well, from time immemorial, they were highly skilled clay workers. The Spaniards, quick to see commercial possibilities, imported highly experienced European potters to teach the native artisans the secret of making glistening Talavera tile and mosaics. Doesn't this look like a simple, easy operation? Remember, however, this man has been plying his trade from childhood, as did his father and his father's father for many preceding generations. The artist, swift and sure, quickly fills in the rough outline of some chosen design. The colors may seem drab and dull as they come from the paint pots, but later the tiles come to life with vibrant color as they emerge from the intense heat of the kiln. the diggers. The grave may expose a perfectly preserved body. The strange phenomena is due, it is said, to the high dry climate and also perhaps to the peculiar mineral properties of the soil. Gotten sight. Bodies stand strangely inanimate along a dark subterranean passage, as if patiently awaiting entrance to another world. The Mexican Union abounds in a great number of excellent spas and resorts. Each possesses individual charm and distinction. The mineral-laden mountains, agitated by deeply internal disturbances, have produced numerous hot springs, rich in certain mineral deposits that are both stimulating and healthful to man. The Indians themselves, for countless centuries before white man's arrival, knew and used these thermal springs to advantage. Perhaps San Jose de Perua is the best known of these resorts. They are famous for the radioactive waters and the rejuvenating properties of its saffron-colored mud packs. The ladies, eager to discover the secret of eternal youth, plaster themselves with the yellow clay. Another resort, Comanhia, near Guanajuato, supports no less than 42 boiling springs. The perfect spot for a roadside lunch, prepared without fuss, is outdoor cook stove. A three-minute egg in two minutes time. Careful there, mister, that's hot. Other springs heat the swimming pools. 
In fact, all the hot water used in this area is supplied by these very springs. Beyond Guanajuato, on top of one of the highest mountains, in the exact geographical center of Mexico, a modern stone shrine has been erected. From this prominence, the rolling fertile lands of four states can be seen, melting into the horizon far away. The massive symmetrical dome of the church is crowned with a heroic figure of El Cristo Rey, Christ the King. The bronze statue, with benevolent arms outstretched, rises 65 feet above the dome. Many Indians make pilgrimages to this shrine. Mexican Indians, in general, are intensely religious, the concepts of their faith often coloring every phase of their lives. Pilgrimages attract the faithful at various times of the year to many churches over the land. Some of these journeys, like the holy trek to San Juan de los Lagos, attract six, 7,000 persons at once. To pay travel expenses, the devout travelers make and sell odd pieces of handwork or carry produce, which they hope to sell. Coinciding with the pilgrimages, enterprising merchants conduct annual fairs, resulting in a time of excitement that eases for a few days the cares of life in Fiesta. Did you ever see a house made of mud? This one is a special variety of clay abundant throughout the country. Formed into adobe, the bricks are used to construct buildings for the wealthy as well as countless homes for the poor. Adobe is frequently employed as a material for stores and public buildings too. The earth is dug up and mixed with straw, the straw acting as a binder. Sufficient water is added to make a stiff doughy mass. When the mixture is of the proper consistency, it is shoveled into wood holes for shaping. The bricks left to dry and bake in the hot Mexican sun will be stacked later on so that air can circulate freely around them. It is customary to coat adobe buildings with a protective covering of plaster. With the plaster coating, adobe is protected from the rains and the weather and will last four years. Guadalajara is the second largest city in the country and continues to expand as an important commercial center. This native carrier is on his way to market with a product that attracts thousands of tourists every year. The Indians use great quantities of the plain, unadorned vessels for cooking, and these can withstand high temperatures, but are otherwise fragile and easily broken. However, they are quite as useful and practical as the metal pots and pans used in modern kitchens. The Guadalajara region is especially noted for the decorative types of pot. Beautifully shaped urns and vases are shipped each year in great numbers to the United States. To the Tonala Indians belong the mastery of producing and painting these fine pieces. Guadalajara pottery is finer than most Mexican ware. Nearly every Indian pueblo supports its own pottery. The most suitable clay is slightly sweet. The women test it by tasting the soil. When the proper clay has been chosen, the job of drying is taken care of nicely by the Mexican sun. Together with bits of broken pottery, the dried clay is then ground into a powder. Later, water will be added to form the moist clay to the potter's need.
size, shape, and beauty, determined entirely by the potter and his wheel, spinning as we watched, it seemed both a product of beauty and a lesson for life. A homely wheel spinning, turning, a lump of clay, shapeless, broken, two skilled hands, both sure and certain. The wheel spins swiftly, the clay lays pliant, the hands work deftly, forming and fashioning to a design, a vessel of beauty or useful, pre-shaped in the potter's mind. How like our lives, encased in clay, a dwelling of beauty eternal, when shaped the potter's way. Pottery, the symbol of man's handwork in Mexican village and city. El Salto Falls, a symbol of the creator's handwork on the Mexican countryside. El Salto, but one of many cataracts hidden from the sight of the casual traveler, whose waters gather in streams at great heights, joining rivers, racing through hollow canyons, pouring over rocky ledges on a hurried rush downward to the sea. graceful, green, and magical too. For where sweet water is scarce, the thirsty soil seems nourished by the very sweat of our native sons. But where life-giving waters flow, barren land is transformed as if by magic into fields and meadows, fair, green, and fruitful. Little known El Salto is off the beaten path, not too distant from Monterey. Can you imagine a more delightful place to reflect on the sights and experiences of the last few weeks, hair-raising adventures of our early storybook friends? El Salto, a pleasant stopping place to rest before the final drive home. Home to vivid memories, friendly faces, pleasant reminders of a never-to-be-forgotten visit to that wonderful land, sun and dust.